I'm Pete Menting from uh, 23 ABC. I'm uh, talking with uh, John Penny of the band Spares. You may remember him, he was in Nev's Atomic Dustbin. Um, so how did the uh, decision to start Spares come about? Well, you know, a pandemic came along and, um, and I got locked in um, as everyone else did. And, you know, 20 years had passed since, since I'd written any, any material. And, and, and that had been in a room with the rest of my bandmates with the Neds, you know. So we, we always used to write songs in a room together, live, on the spot. Um, a kind of a magic would, would happen or not happen, as the case would be. And, um, and that's where all of the Ned songs came from. So my experience in songwriting was, was that experience exclusively, you know. Um, in lockdown, um, it kind of forced me to have a bit of a reboot because I'm not a full-time musician these days. I, I, I earn money other ways, you know. Um, so ordinary life, I guess, and, and, and the necessary other careers and things are kind of taking things over. Um, and and it kind of the lockdown kind of rebooted me and reminded me that actually I quite like writing songs. I quite like being a musician. Um, so I looked at my acoustic guitar, which which I can't play. I'm absolutely rubbish at, at, at most instruments, especially guitar. Um, and I thought, you know what, I might pick this up and have a bit of a plink on it and see see where it goes. But not not to write songs, just to kind of entertain myself a bit. Um, and I got I got an app for my phone, a four track app. I didn't even know these things existed because I'm a bit of a Luddite. Um, and I started putting these little little snippets, only ever like a minute long, of, of, of silly guitar lines or chord progressions and stuff. And then I'd start layering them up, which is something I'd never individually done before. And I quite liked some of the stuff that, that, that I was doing, but I was doing it really to distract myself. I wasn't doing it because I thought, well, this is going to go somewhere. I'm going to write songs and and get a new band together or any of this kind of stuff i just did it for my own entertainment's sake and, and i started really getting into it and enjoying it my phone filled up with ideas um and then all of a sudden one day I, I just thought you know what maybe maybe i could do something with this and then i think i wasted about another two or three months thinking well who on earth is going to want to work with me who on earth is going to listen to one of these little snippets i've put on my phone and think yeah that's great yeah i really want to get on board that one um, and I scratched my head and scratched my head, and then, and then in the end, in, in, and I'm ashamed to say, it's in desperation, I, I popped a message to to a couple of the guys from Neds and just said, "Does anybody fancy writing some songs? Anyone? You know?" And Dan came back and said, "Yes." Um, and you know, something just twigged because Dan had been hidden in plain sight the whole time. Dan is the guy in the Neds who can play anything. He's the multi-instrumentalist. Just because he's the drummer in the Neds doesn't mean he's not everything else that he is. Yeah. But my mentality was still full on, well, it's the Neds. Everything is the Neds, you know. Yeah. I sent down some stuff and within days, he turned little ideas into, into the instrumentals for, for whole songs. Wow. And then I was back into that zone of being inspired by music I was listening to, not trying to be inspired by music I was playing myself, you know, and things move really, really rapidly. So that, that's that's where Spares came about, really. Oh, nice. Yeah, just uh, listening to like the first couple of snippets, I was pretty impressed by it. So, you know, I had to go ahead and pre-order it for sure. And Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> thank, you, thank you for creating such great music. And I was impressed that Dan created all all the music for that. It was pretty amazing. Well, you know, yeah. like yeah, I mean, like like, like I say, the, the 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 lockdown kind of rebooted lots of people. I think I think it reminded a lot of people of who they are and what they what they do and what they're capable of. You know, and um, the business of always having an excuse that you haven't got time, you haven't got time for that. You know, I've got to go to work. I've got to do this. I've got to look after the kids. I've got to whatever it is, mundane or exciting or whatever. Yeah. When all those obstacles are kind of removed and, and you, you have a reminder of, of who you are, um, all of a sudden your focus can be so much stronger. Um, and Dan's focus just, I don't know where it, where it came from all of a sudden, but he's just such a such a focused man. And, you know, we, we, we booked the studio eight days we booked. 
Um, we'd never met, by the way. We'd, we'd never actually been face to face in the entire songwriting process. Um, so we, we came up with 11 songs via email and WhatsApp. Uh, that's how we, we got the songs together. But when we booked the studio for eight days, Dan went down and I couldn't be there for the first four days. But I just couldn't get there. I was, I was doing other things. Dan went down and he recorded every last piece of instrumentation in four and a half days on his own. <laughs> I arrived because he said, oh, I'll go and record it. And I'm thinking, oh, we'll be lucky if we get an EP out of this, you know. I go down there and I'm like, what? <laughs> how? How on earth? <laughs> Uh, and, and then and then then me, I suppose my memory of recording was a vocal a day, maybe, you know, five or six takes of, of one vocal a day and get me into the mood for it. And I was kind of faffing around and whatever. Yeah. I did 11 songs in three days. And, and, and in the Neds, I never did any backing vocals. In these, every single song has backing vocals. Some of them have several hmm. of my own. That focus, that kind of focus with a with a with a with a, a short term aim to just go and do it for the love of doing it, you know. Yeah. Um, so it was a little bit non traditional during the pandemic. Then, how did it kind of did it work a little bit better um, having all the songs kind of fleshed out before you went in the studio? Yeah, absolutely, and 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 you know. I've never I've never arrived in a studio without without songs completed in in my experience of of, of, yeah. of the Neds and working with Dan as well. So we we always went to the studio pretty much 100% on what we were going to record. You know, yeah. um, I guess um, here and there there were there were a few dabblings by producers on the second and third album, but they were kind of minor things. We we kind of ironed out the what was being played where and when and, and, and most of that kind of stuff. There'd be a little bit of um, collaboration here and there, but we'd, we'd be pretty clear usually. And so I guess Dan and I knew at what point we needed to, 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 to get into that studio. We knew where we needed to, we knew where we needed to get the songs to, okay. to be able to go down there and just get, get them recorded. Yeah. Okay. I've been impressed with like uh, the two singles so far. Um, how was Dan able to get all those parts together? <laughs> well, I mean, it's a shame Dan's not here. Because yeah. you go, oh, well, I just did it, you know. Um, <laughs> oh, you just did it, you know. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't know. He's, he's just, I, I have to say, I was absolutely astonished that the, the first time he sent me a file through. Because what I'd sent to him was um, a chord progression and one vocal melody idea for that chord progression. And I'd said to him, well, I, I think it might, my idea is this kind of vibe, but you know what? For working together, you see what you think as well. And what he sent me back was an entire song formatted with drums, bass, guitar, everything that he'd done at home on on his on his um, Porter studio. And he'd just come up with those parts, you know. He'd in some cases he reflected stuff that I'd done and 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 changed what I'd done on a guitar to doing it on a bass or vice versa or you know, he'd, he'd, he'd interpret what I'd sent. In some cases, he'd play what I'd, what, I'd, what I'd sent to him and embellish the rest all around it. But he seemed to have been able to, no matter what it was I sent, he was able to make sense of it all and suggest where it ought to go, where I wasn't sure it should. Um, and, and, you know, happily, I don't think there was ever a case where I thought, no, no, that's, no, that's not where it wants to go. No, no, that, that didn't happen once, you know. It's kind of like a... I don't know, it's, it's almost like a magic chemistry, which, you know, a lot of bands benefit from. Successful bands get that chemistry, don't they? You can't necessarily create it. It just happens, and you're very, very lucky if it happens. Um, I just felt incredibly lucky, incredibly lucky. And I know uh, Ned, Ned's fans are pretty excited about it. Um, what can you tell them about the rest of the songs? Well, you know, the the um the beauty with with Neds was that we we were five different guys with different opinions, throwing all kinds of different stuff into the mix, and I think that helped us to be unique. Um, there were a lot of people to to try and satisfy in that in that mix of of, of what style wise what we came out with, you know, and and the 
the converse of that was that it was a curse as well because as, as we got older and more stuck in our individual ways we were less willing to to compromise on what we wanted to do and finding those compromises got harder and harder to do because we had that fan base and we all had our own opinion about where we should take that fan base or leave that fan base you know it's it's five people and it's a it's a bureaucracy a democracy it's a difficult old thing to balance you know with spares what what dan and i have done really is we've just followed our noses so some of these ideas i came out with to begin with and some of dan's ideas too they've got influences that we don't really know where they came from you know um but we wouldn't have walked into an Ed's atomic dustbin rehearsal with them not in a million years so what we've been able to do i guess with this record is is to and on each individual song is just follow our nose in the direction of where that song wants to go and so that style wise there is quite quite a breadth of, of of variation in the album you know much more variation than you ever would have got with an ed's album back then maybe now it would maybe it would be different now but back then it still needed to feel like this is where we're all going together we're going here you know with spares it's, that's not the case we we've gone okay this song wants to go here and this song wants to go there and this song wants to go there so there is quite a bit of variation uh, amongst the songs so that's really don't good. expect yeah. don't expect a ned's album that's for certain yeah you'll recognize elements i think here and there um but we've we've surprised ourselves i think in, in quite a lot of it i've certainly surprised myself that's always good and it's always good to have that variation too, because even on your la on Ned's last album, there's quite a difference in song structures and styles too, which yeah. I always think is really good. Because, well, yeah, I mean, you 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 have that quandary, don't you? That, um, will the fans come with us or not? Uh, and 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 inevitably they don't all. That's that's what happens, isn't it? You know, it's like in Spinal Tap. It's that <laughs> your audience just gets. <laughs> <laughs> more selective um <laughs> but yeah i mean you're lucky you're a lucky band if you can take your fans with you in every every phase that you change but it was a necessity for us as people in the neds for things to change we we couldn't make another godfather we couldn't make another are you normal we couldn't because we were the people that we were who'd moved on from being those people that wrote those songs um and as I say, that that got increasingly difficult to 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 be able to balance out between us. Um, but change, I mean, change is inevitable, isn't it? Uh, it's just a question of of how much you embrace it. I think and it's one of one of the lessons that I've learned since Ned's heyday is that um, fighting change is just such a such a pointless exercise. You've got to try to go 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 along with it and 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 steer it where you can. But you've got to be open to it and the more open you are to change i think that the more likely new and exciting stuff can come about definitely are you uh planning on uh touring the states behind the album at all well i mean we, we're kind of trying not to plan anything un until people kind of make the demand necessary if you see what i mean so we're going to string five dates together in the uk in may and we'll see how those go um if they go phenomenally well and if people in the states want to hear our stuff we we'd, we'd consider it but we, we're not taking anything for granted you know it's kind of it's a different world out there just now and um I'm, i'd be chuffed to bits if lots of neds fans like it but i'm i'm not um uh, i'm not kidding myself into thinking that they're all gonna like it because they're not you know some some probably will just think mm, not for me you know some some might really like it more than Ned's. i don't know really we, we just got to see what the reaction is to it i suppose um but i, I i'm starting off from a from a, a small expectation so f f just to give you an idea f for me making a record was was just a massive achievement for me um, and, and just the feeling that we actually made one is, is just great for me so anything else is, is a huge bonus but I don't expect for anything really. Okay. Um, you also did a Ned's acoustic dustbin with uh, stripped down Ned songs with the rat. Is yeah. a new Ned's album going to be a possibility at all? <laughs> yeah, you know, 
I wish I could be more positive about that one. Um, you know, as as I said before, the, the magic with with Ned's songwriting was was those five guys in a room together with time. Um, we've got the five guys, but we don't have the time um, because we're we're not a full time band, and we, we you know we've we've lived thirty years since, and uh, some of us are quite involved with other stuff, you know, um, careers and whatever. So being able to release yourself regularly into a rehearsal room for five or six hours um, to write songs, it just at the moment is an impossibility, you know. And and what I, what I've had to do, and I think the, the other guys who who are keen on writing have had to do is is just kind of be be calm with that, you know. And and right. and it's it's a shame, but it is what it is. It may change one day. I don't know. It'd be nice to think it would, but we we're just doing what we can do and and you know spares really and yeah. ned's acoustic really they're things that we can do so we're, we're just using the tools at our disposal to to satisfy ourselves in the now but the future we we don't know i guess yeah it makes sense um do you think there will be more uh, spares albums in the future yeah i reckon so we're all we're already writing um, we've already got songs that aren't on this album. Um, some of them will uh, they'll get played on the on the tour, I think. Um, so yeah, we we we're, we're sticking at it. We're enjoying it, you know, and that's that's the key, isn't it? When you enjoy something, you you get a lot out of it. And I think that the more you enjoy something, the more other people get out of it as well. So the, we got no no reason to stop now. Um, and, and you know, it's not difficult for for spares and Neds to. To exist together because Neds right. don't make any massive demands on on our time, um, and and you know we can we can uh, we can just keep chipping away at spares. It's it's our own agenda. We we make the agenda ourselves, so it's it's very nice in that respect. Yeah, because because Rats are already doing other stuff too with uh, Obey Robots. So I mean, yeah, yeah, all these bands can coexist. I think and. It just adds to it because I think uh, a lot of fans of Neds just love hearing new music from you guys. So, well, I, I'm you know I, I'm chuffed to bits, and I and, and I hope lots of you do so that we can keep doing it. You know, um, yeah, it's as I say, the, the the lockdown rebooted me a bit and reminded me of what what I really love to do. You know, sometimes life doesn't allow you to do what you love to do very much. Sometimes you, you you're just not able to. To get amongst it but when you find a way that's that's just a great thing so dan dan's kind of found a way for 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 me to write songs again which is just a wonderful thing and and rap with the the acoustic stuff has found a way for me to get on stage a bit more often as well you know and that's that's a wonderful thing too so um i'm, I'm up for what i've got time for you know it's good yeah, yeah definitely I'm sure you probably have answered this question like a ton of times, but I'm still kind of curious. Uh, how did the idea for um, two bases come about? Because uh, that makes it seem so seamless. Whereas there's been other bands like since since you guys stopped stopped recording new music that have tried it, it just doesn't work. So how how has it kind of worked for for you guys? Well, the the, the sim okay, the shortened version of. Why we had two yeah. bass players. Um, I invited one to, to come and rehearse with me. Um, I got a little bit drunk. In the meantime, forgot about that invitation. I went to see another band, saw another bass player, entirely different um, style of playing, Alex. And his band was uh, splitting up. And I said, well, do you fancy having a jam together? Uh, and then at the first Ned's rehearsal, um, there were two guys with bass guitars um and and it was like oh oh sorry guys uh <laughs> mm, interesting um dan the drummer came along and played drums just for a favor because he wanted to play bass so there were three bass players in the room and then um rap came and i'd only seen rat play bass i'd never seen him play guitar he'd only just started to learn to play guitar so we had four bass players in the room at the first Ned's rehearsal. <laughs> luckily, Dan was willing to stay on the drums and uh, and luckily Rat learned how to play the guitar well. 
But the two base players, obviously Matt and Alex, it, Matt learned to play more of a traditional base, but but I suppose key is that it was from the very, very start. So um, it wasn't like adapting to having another base in the band. It was kind of like learning on, on the spot and, and coming out with our version of, of, of a five-piece band with two bases in it. It was, it was very organic and natural, really. That's cool. So Ned could have ended up with four bass players then. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, we could. Um, we never would have had five though, because I've got no chance whatsoever of uh, playing any instrument to any great uh, proficiency. So at least we would have stopped at four. <laughs> That's funny. Um, so with Ned's Pop Will Eat Itself and The Wonder Stuff all coming from the same town, um, can you talk about how special a time that was and uh, when you guys all started? Yeah, it's it's a funny thing, isn't it? Um, people talk about the Stourbridge scene because it all supposedly happened in Stourbridge. Well, it Stourbridge was the was the epicenter of, of of what was going on, I guess. And and the, the reason why Stourbridge um, became the place that, that everyone talked about basically was because the, a lot of the bands were drinking there. But a lot of the bands were drinking there because there was an art college there. And there were a lot of creative people in and around Stourbridge. Um, and in, in those days, late 80s, early 90s, um, you weren't particularly safe if, if you were if you were regarded as a freak or a goth or, a, or whatever, you know. So there were certain pubs that were kind of like uh, safe houses, if you like, in Stourbridge. It wasn't an overly violent place, but it wasn't. Your, your company was not appreciated everywhere. Um, and I guess the, the pubs that people went to became a bit of a pot boiler. And because creative types, not not exclusively, but fairly generally, are em empathic people, they kind of tend to care a little bit more. Not all of them, of course. There's some real horribles, but um, I think people were willing to to help each other out a bit. Um, and of course, what happened was that Popper Leeds itself, um, they got a deal. Um, they were very DIY, and they they. John Peel played them on the on the radio, and we all started turning for them. Their friends were ex members from a previous previous band, um, and they formed a band called the Wonder Stuff. And again, they they're kind of drinking together, and they're starting to do shows together, and they get signed. Um, and these people are drinking in the pub that that myself and and the rest of the band are, are drinking in. You know, we have a pint of Dutch courage and say, oh, we've got a gig upstairs next week and our bass amp's broken. Any chance we could borrow yours? Expect them to go, oh, get lost, you know. But they turn and go, yeah, all right then. Yeah, yeah. And they come along and they have a listen, probably just because they don't want to see their bass amp get blown up or stolen. But they come along and they listen and they enjoy it. And then they decide that they're going to give us a leg up as well. Um, and, and, and that's the way it worked. It was kind of like monkey see, monkey do. But, you know, a big part of it, I think, was purely that, that business of having someone stood at the bar in a pub next to you who was on the telly last week in a band. And this, this person is real. They're, they're not like some mythical creature. They're, that's a real person. And you've just spilt your beer on their sleeve and they haven't gone crazy at you and said, do you know who I am? Or, or you know, go away, minion. Or, you know, they've been like, oh, it's all right, mate. No worries. Yeah, it's all right. Ordinary people doing extraordinary things. It kind of you don't you don't stand there and think, oh, if you can do it, I can do it. But something in your in your consciousness is telling you that you know this is an ordinary guy. He's a he's a, he's a nice person. He's like there's no airs and graces. This is a guy off the street. I see every other week in the pub, and he's on the telly. Ah, right. Wouldn't mind a bit of that. And and it's a great motivator, you know. Um, but, you know, the, I think the great irony about the, the, the whole Stourbridge scene and, you know, realistically for, for a lot of scenes, although as because it's such a small town, it's, it's quite funny. The irony is that really a scene was made by people who were desperate to get out. <laughs> you know, let's get out of Stourbridge. Stourbridge, was, it was a nice place. We, you know, we, we loved drinking there. We loved the friends we got there. But your ambition says to get out into the world, doesn't it, you know? Go spread your spread your seeds everywhere and, and, and leave a big mark on as, as big as you possibly can everywhere, you know. So ironically, you 
everyone's kind of taking coach trips to Stourbridge to see the, the, the mecca of indie rock and you're in Australia on tour or you're in Sweden doing a festival or, you know, you're in London recording an album. You're not there, but uh, the mecca is. <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny.